So we are going to take a deep dive into Unit 2 today. We'll be looking at Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech through the rhetorical lens. So obviously we've done a bell ringer. We're going to do a mini lesson for close reading, and then there will be some independent reading time. Well, there was supposed to be. You'll see. All right. So our objective is still RI 9.6, and our objective is I can identify rhetorical devices in the I Have a Dream speech. Okay, so before we do any of the actual analysis, I want to take a second to just think about our new unit. Our new unit is all about literature of the civil rights movement. If you picked up a textbook, that is on page 250 in the textbook. But we are going to be looking at texts that really consider how words can create change and social change, to be very exact. Our two driving questions are going to be, how can words inspire change, number one? And then how do words have the power to provoke, calm, or inspire? <clears throat> so we're going to do this really quick activity and sort of activate our prior knowledge about what's going on in the year of 1963. <clears throat> If you were in my blue team last week, you actually went ahead and did this assignment. And you also read a text called 1963, the year everything changed. So you got a really good overview of what was going on in this time period. But just for everybody else, let's run through it. One of the most important and memorable speeches of the civil rights movement, I Have a Dream, was delivered by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial during March on the March on Washington. But this wasn't the speech he prepared for that day. Is that true or is that false? <clears throat> well, since I've taught it, let's say, five times a day, I know that that's true. <sighs> and... The interesting part is, when you think about it, the only thing that was not false about that, which is kind of a trick question, the only thing that was not true about that, <clears throat> or let me speak correctly, I'm so sorry, it's been a long day. We have, but this wasn't the speech he prepared for that day. He actually really ad-libbed that last part you know the most iconic part the i have a dream i have a dream i have a dream that this i have a dream that 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 part was very ad-libbed so that's where they're getting that answer number two laws prohibiting interracial marriage are ruled unconstitutional by the u.s supreme court we need to put our heads in 1963 do we think this is true? I, this tripped me up a lot. I think I'm remembering this is false. Yes. Okay. So it wasn't made to be quote unconstitutional until 1967 in the Loving versus Virginia trial. At that point, laws preventing interracial marriage were ruled unconstitutional. That was in 1967. Dr. In, Dr. Carter G. Woodson originated what we now call Black History Month. I really didn't know this one. I had to kind of guess. But the answer is true. I thought this date was interesting because he actually started this in 1926. And then it became it was a week, you know, Negro History Week. And then they expanded it to an entire month later on. Martin... D Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his famous letter from Birmingham jail advocating for nonviolent civil disobedience. That is 100% true. <clears throat> During the protest at the end of segregation laws in Birmingham, Alabama, the Commissioner of Public Safety, Bull Connor, calls for the use of police dogs and fire hoses to repel black protesters. That is one of those sad, unfortunate truths, right? We've all seen the pictures. 
All right, Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church, a rallying destination for the city's civil rights movement, is bombed, killing four young girls attending Sunday school. This marked a crucial turning point for the civil rights movement. Is this true or is this false? That's true. We've all heard of the 16th, 16th Avenue Church. Wait, no, sorry. It's 16th Street Church bombing, right? It's another one of those sad truths of 1963. All right, nine African-American students, Little Rock Nine, enroll in Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas, but are denied access by the State National Guard. True or false? That's going to be false. Actually, they were being protected and helped into the school by the National Guard. There were other people there protesting and were like, no, nah, you can't come in. But the National Guard were like, ha ha, have you read Brown versus Board of Education? Because they can. All right, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year for 1963, making him the first African-American recipient of the honor. That is going to be true. Then finally, President Kennedy falls for America to be the land of the free for all citizens and asks for public support in a civil rights bill outlawing major forms of discrimination in the U.S. I want to take a second and like, Think back to what we know about President Kennedy from Unit 1. We read about him in American History, that short story, how the immigrant families were just distraught that he'd been assassinated, number one. So that gives us like an idea of his character. And then number two, we actually read a text by Kennedy wherein he discussed how important immigrants had been to America. And he also touched on the fate of like African-Americans in America. So based on the character we know of President Kennedy, I'm going to say true, and that is very true. So I got 100, but I've also taken this quiz five times today. So let's sneak back over here. We've done this stuff. Now I want to scooch on and talk about I Have a Dream. We know that Dr. King completely completed his famous I Have a Dream speech from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. We just talked about this, right? The question is, why is that significant? I'm sort of, we sort of discussed this in all of the classes today, and I'm just going to give you like a roundabout answer. It is significant for many reasons, but, oh, Becca, sorry. But really what they're trying to accomplish with that is sort of to remind everyone there that this work that Dr. King has started or, well, is continuing, you know, was started with President Lincoln and also harnessing that credibility that Lincoln has, because many people respect Lincoln as one of our presidents. So we're harnessing some of that credibility into some ethos, right, or appeal to authority. So just to review our rhetoric, rhetoric is the art of persuasion. We've gone over that. Ethos is the appeal to authority. It's going to involve a credible person. And in literature and or speeches, which is what we're doing today, ethos is going to be shown through allusions to famous people or powerful people. So like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, um, the Declaration of Independence. It could also be a text. And we're going to see some examples of that in I Have a Dream. Logos. That is an appeal to logic. It involves reasoning, statistics, and or facts. The use of numbers, statistics, all that good stuff. This one you're not going to see much of in Dr. King. He doesn't use much logos. He uses a lot of ethos and a lot of pathos. Just FYI. Whoop, go back. Then we have pathos. That's our appeal to emotions. They're trying to make you feel something, either happiness, nostalgia, sadness, um, anger, maybe. You know, if you want to look back at our driving question, how do words have the power to provoke, calm, or inspire? You know, those are, that's pathos right there. You know, those are emotions. And the question is, how can words 
have the power to unlock those emotions. And that's what we're really going to un unpack in this unit. <sighs> All right, so that was a really big introduction. Go ahead and grab your copy of I Have a Dream and then log on to the close reading video and we will get started.